Hello and welcome to my talk, Inside the Magic, a Merlin Walkthrough, where today we will talk about a post-exploitation command and control tool I wrote that leverages several versions of the HTTP protocol. Quick introduction, my name is Russell Vantile and I'm an offensive security operator at SpectreOps. I can be reached on Twitter under the handle NeonDog, but I use the Twitter handle Merlin underscore C2 for all information about this tool. If you wanna chat about Merlin, please stop by the Bloodhound Gang Slack space and visit the Merlin channel. It's a much better place to start a conversation as opposed to using something like a GitHub issue. Today, we're going to start by talking through the various versions of the HTTP protocol because they are the protocols that Merlin uses for command and control traffic. Next, we'll move into a deep dive of the underlying concepts and protocols that Merlin uses for authentication and encryption. I'll also do a demo of interacting with the various Merlin server menus and commands. To wrap things up, I'll show some power usage examples for working with the Merlin agent, such as dynamic JA3 hash configurations and a simple trick to bypass Windows Defender. So what is Merlin? Merlin is a cross-platform post-exploitation command and control tool that I wrote in the Go language. One thing that I like about Go is that it cross-compiles easily to 10 different operating systems and nine different architectures. If you ever find yourself needing to get an agent on something like an ARM host, Go's got you covered. I originally wrote this tool when I was taking a look at the HTTP2 protocol. Originally, Merlin only supported the HTTP2 protocol, and it was developed to bypass network detections. Because the HTTP2 protocol only uses ephemeral cipher suites and perfect forward secrecy enabled cipher suites, it makes it hard for proxies to decrypt traffic in line by using something like an RSA key. The only option is to terminate the connection and restart a new one or simply deny it. Additionally, many network tools did not have the ability to decode the binary based HTTP2 protocol at the time, so it made it a good candidate to get past detections. I later came around to adding support for HTTP version 1.1 to enable domain fronting, as well as the HTTP3 protocol. If you ever have any questions about Merlin or want to look up additional information for it, I recommend that you stop by the wiki at read the docs. I try to do my best to keep that thing updated with all the questions I get asked by people. If you find it's missing a piece of information you'd like, please let me know and I'll get it updated. So let's do a quick talk through the different versions of HTTP. This slide quickly depicts the various versions of the protocol that have come out over the years. The very first version of HTTP did not even have a version number. It was retroactively assigned to separate it from version one. Version one was the first official version and dates back to 1996. Not too long thereafter, version 1.1 was released in 1997 and made a couple updates to the protocol. There were several problems with HTTP version 1.1 that reduced its efficiency, such as one TCP connection per resource that a web page loads and head of line blocking. Head of line blocking is when a server requests a large file like a big image or a large JavaScript and it blocks all the rest of the components from loading until that one loads first. So oftentimes web pages don't render quickly because of this. To fix this, Google started testing a new protocol they were calling Speedy at the time. Google's preliminary protocol later became the basis for the official HTTP2 protocol found in RFC 7540 in 2015. Not too long after this, Google started working on another new protocol called QUIC for Quick UDP Internet Connection. This protocol is still an IETF draft and is not official yet. Let's take a look at the HTTP2 version of the protocol. This version of HTTP is multiplexed and bidirectional, meaning you can have multiple conversations over one connection and traffic can flow back and forth between the server and the client. This version of the protocol also only supports ephemeral cipher suites and perfect forward secrecy enabled cipher suites. And it also has a server push feature. This is where if the server knows you're going to request a resource, 
it will go ahead and send it to you so that way you don't have to request it. Originally when HTTP2 was coming about, there was some debate on whether there should be a clear text version of HTTP2 or not. The RFC does document a clear text version denoted as H2C. However, none of the major browsers support this protocol. In some of my limited testing, I have found this an interesting way to have traffic leave a network on port 80. There are two ways that a client can establish an upgrade to an HTTP2 connection. With no prior knowledge, the client does not know if the server supports version two of the protocol or not. For clear text HTTP URIs, the client sends an upgrade header. And if the server supports that version, it will respond with a 101 status code for switching protocols. For HTTPS URIs, a client advertises what protocol version it supports through the TLS 1.2 ALPN extension. I have a couple images showing you these here in a second. When an HTTP 1.1 client is communicating with the server that supports version two of the protocol, the server will respond with the alt services header. This tells the client that the server supports other versions of the protocol. Now that the client has knowledge, it will start a conversation with the server using that protocol directly and does not have to negotiate an upgrade. An HTTP client uses the upgrade header to switch from version 1.1 to another protocol and it's only used for the clear text version of HTTP2, which again is not supported by the major browsers. If the server supports that protocol, then it again responds with that 101 status code. The client begins the conversation by responding with what's known as the connection preface or the magic stream, which consists of the letters PRI, asterisk, space HTTP2, some new lines, SM and then some morning lines, or just simply PRISM. I decided to name my program Merlin as a play on the words magic string that is unique to the HTTP2 protocol. This is an image of the TLS 1.2 ALPN extension, advertising that this client supports the H2 protocol, the speedy protocol, and regular HTTP 1.1 protocol. And lastly, here is an image depicting what a alt services header looks like when a server responds to a client. In this image, it is saying that it supports the HTTP3 protocol and the HTTP2 protocol, and they can both be found on port 443. Let's take a quick look at HTTP3. So quick or quick UDP internet connection is a UDP based protocol. Quick can transport many other protocols on it, not just HTTP2, but is the one that was primarily being used. During some conversations, it was decided that it was best to name this version of HTTP over Quick, just simply HTTP3. What's interesting about Quick is that it's UDP based, but acts like TCP. And it does this in user land space, which is a part of the application that the application can control, unlike the kernel space for TCP. Quick has some unique features that make it very valuable, such as zero round trip time, congestion control, connection migration, and it starts off supporting TLS 1.3. I personally find connection migration interesting because what happens is when you establish an HTTP3 connection, you're assigned a connection ID and you can switch networks multiple times, whether it's from your cellular interface to a Wi-Fi interface to a hardwired connection, and you can maintain the same HTTP3 connection due to that connection ID. Additionally, Quick has multiplexing without head of line blocking because it can send multiple streams. And just like we showed in the last slide, you can negotiate HTTP3 using the alt service header. Here's a quick image from Daniel Stenberg, the creator of curl and from his book, HTTP3 Explained. Notice the parts in yellow on the right-hand side that kind of show how quick fits on a stack. And then I quickly wanted to show kind of how HTTP3 is beneficial. On the far left-hand side of this image, you see three arrows going back and forth, and that is your normal TCP connection setup. To make things more complicated for HTTPS, you have your three connections for your TCP setup, then your 
three pieces of traffic back and forth for your TLS handshake, and then you can start your conversation. With Quick, the very first message that a client sends to a server has everything it needs to set up a connection and does not need multiple trips back and forth to establish the connection. This image quickly illustrates the difference between HTTP2 head of line blocking versus how it is circumvented and quick. The failure of one of the connections, let's say the red connection, doesn't prevent the connections in blue and green from continuing on like they do on HTTP2. So this makes it valuable. I will say that most organizations do not actually allow UDP to leave their network, but the Google Chrome browser does often try to talk over quick, especially for sites like YouTube. Let's take a deep dive into the key components of Merlin's application concepts, such as its message structure, the opaque key exchange protocol, HTTP payload encryption through JWEs, and JWT authentication and authorization. I did want to say that the HTTP payload that is used with Merlin leverages the Golang specific GOB encoding. This encoding only works when both the server and the client are Go based. So here's an example of a message that goes between a Merlin client and server. Every message starts with a message base like this one. The base has some key fields such as the version number, the ID that represents the agent it belongs to, and the type is the embedded or nested message that goes inside of it. In this example, you can see that the embedded message is the agent control with a job ID that is sending the kill command to an agent to exit. Another unique feature of Merlin is message padding. I heard that oftentimes command and control detection is picked up based on constant message sizes going out at regular intervals, especially when the agent is just checking in. One trick that Merlin uses to get around this is it adds a random pad to every single message that goes back and forth up to the configurable size. By default, that is 4096. So it will send a string of characters somewhere in that range every single time. This keeps the command and control traffic messages from not being the same size over and over again, especially when it's just doing a status check-in. And the last field is the token field, and this is where the server passes a JWT to the agent, which we'll talk about more later. One goal of command and control traffic is to add another layer of traffic encryption on top of transport layer security, like SSL TLS. This prevents defenders from inspecting traffic contents. In order to do this, the client and the server need to agree on a secret key so that way they can both encrypt and decrypt traffic. One popular method is to configure the agent with a pre-shared asymmetric key at compile time. This is seen in tools like Cobalt Strike. When a client and server use a weak pre-shared symmetric key to start a conversation that later results in exchanging asymmetric keys, it is known as a password authenticated key exchange. The encrypted key exchange is a subtype of that, as well as the opaque key exchange protocol. This protocol is still an IETF draft and has unique features such as registration, mutual authentication, leverages a secret salt, and an encrypted envelope, which we will talk about those here in the next section. Okay, it's time for everyone to buckle up because we're going to talk a little bit about crypto. Even though I mostly understand this, I will admit that talking about crypto often hurts my head and I can get lost quickly. I do have a blog post on this where you can walk through the steps individually. Also, if you'd like, the RFC does a good job of explaining each of the pieces, but I'm going to walk through and tell you the Merlin implementation of the opaque key exchange. So to begin with, the Merlin agent has a password. This password is randomly generated and 30 characters long and is run through 5,000 iterations of the PBK DF2. This password, known as PWDU, is never transmitted across a network ever. The next component we have is the pre-shared key, which can be specified when calling the Merlin agent on the command line. By default, this is Merlin. You can see off to the right this image where the client is sending a message to the server. What happens is the client generates what's known as an alpha, which is derived from PWDU 
and is sent to the server along with the user ID, which in this case is just the agent's UUID. This is not an opaque requirement, but it is a Merlin implementation. Those two pieces of information are encrypted with the pre-shared key before they are sent to the server. If an attacker happens to capture the user ID or alpha in transit, that is not a problem. The opaque protocol is resistant to all of the pieces of information being transferred back and forth, being captured by an attacker. The server begins registration by creating a private key or privs, a public key, which is pubs, and a per user oblivious pseudo random function key known as KU. This is what's called a secret salt and is stored on the server. With opaque, the server never has the user's password or hash. The only thing that the server has is this secret salt value KU. It is never transmitted to the client. This key KU is used to compute salt2 or also known as V in this diagram. You can think of SALT2 like a public key to the private key KU. What the server does is it also generates beta, which is derived from both the alpha the client sent and the secret SALT. The server sends back to the client the server's public key V and beta. All right, finishing up the last step of registration, the user executes an oblivious pseudo random function, providing it the password PWDU, which was generated in the first step, along with beta, which was just sent by the server, and the V values returned from the server as well. The oblivious pseudo random function outputs a random password known as RWDU. This password is only known to the user. This RWD value cannot be calculated by the server, it does not have enough information. It needs the PWD piece, which it does not have. The client generates its own public key known as PubU, as well as a private key, PrivU. Both of these are encrypted with the random password, RWDU, into a single envelope denoted as ENVU. This is the encrypted envelope that will be sent back to the server for storage. What the user does is it takes this encrypted envelope and its public key and sends it back to the server for storage. Again, the Merlin implementation encrypts this information with the pre-shared key, but if the values are recovered by an attacker in transit, that is not a problem. So here's all these steps of registration. At this point in the conversation, the agent has a password, the server has a salt, and they both know about each other. But the server does not have the agent's password and the agent does not have the secret salt value. After opaque registration is complete, then we have to move into authentication. A lot of these steps are the same as registration with some key differences. The opaque authentication step uses the authenticated Diffie-Hellman key exchange Sigma I protocol for key exchange. I'm not gonna dive deep into the Sigma I protocol, but if you want to know more, you can find details in the opaque key exchange RFC. What happens is the client generates an alpha just like it did during registration and sends key exchange message one, the alpha and the user ID back to the server. All this information is encrypted with the pre-shared key. The server receives alpha from the user and calculates beta using the same method defined in registration. The server will look up the per user oblivious pseudo random function key or secret salt and use it to generate salt too, just like it did during registration. Additionally, the server will look up the encrypted envelope that it got from the agent during registration. The server will go ahead and calculate the second key exchange message, which is key two, that is derived from the server's private key and key exchange message one. At this point, the server is able to derive a symmetric secret from key exchange messages one and two. What happens is the server sends back to the client V, beta, the encrypted envelope and key exchange message two. The user receives beta and V from the server and again calculates the random password RWDU just like it did during registration. Now that the agent has the random password RWDU and the encrypted envelope, it is able to decrypt the 
encrypted envelope and extract out the information which contained the user's private key, the user's public key, and the server's public key. To finish authentication, the user will send the third and last key exchange message to the server. At this point, the agent has all the information it needs to also derive the same symmetric key S that the server did. So through key exchange messages one and two, they've both been able to derive a shared secret. At this point, all traffic going back and forth between the agent and the client is now encrypted with the symmetric secret and no longer encrypted with the pre-shared key. And here's a final look at all the steps going back and forth for opaque authentication. A pre-positioned attacker that captures the alpha, beta, and B values that traverse the network will not be able to derive the random password view. And without that password, an attacker can't decrypt a captured encrypted envelope, even if it wanted to. The default pre-share key for Merlin is simply Merlin in lowercase. I did not intend for people to actually use that pre-share key when operating Merlin. And I wanted a way to discourage individuals from using that pre-share key, so I created a program called Prism. This name continues on the HTTP2 connection preface magic string that we talked about a couple slides back. The Prism application can be used to fingerprint a Merlin server using the default pre-shared key by completing the first step of opaque authentication. If the target server is using Merlin and is using the Merlin pre-shared key, then the Prism will be able to decrypt and decode traffic validating what's going on. In order for this to work, you must know both the URL and the pre-shared key. The reason this is, is because if you send traffic to Merlin and you don't know the correct URL, then it will just respond with the 404. Prism will also fingerprint versions prior to version eight when there was no opaque key exchange. And it does this just by simply looking at the JSON message structure. And if it understands it, then it knows that it's a Merlin server. This image here on the bottom shows a quick example of using the Prism to prove that this target server is actually using Merlin. Merlin leverages several JavaScript object notations for its web traffic. Today, we're just going to talk about JSON web encryption and JSON web tokens. So the traffic going back and forth between a Merlin agent and the Merlin server is encrypted using that derived secret that we talked about during opaque authentication. That secret is used to encrypt data into a structure known as a JSON web encryption format. Merlin uses the PBK DF2 with HMAC, SHA-512, and AES-256 GCM key wrap. And I know that's a lot of stuff to talk about. What, in a second, we'll try and talk about the individual pieces. What you need to take away is that every single message that goes back and forth between the agent and the client has its own unique per message content encryption key known as the KEG. Initially, this per message content encryption key is derived from the pre-shared key, which is just Merlin lowercase. But after the agent has authenticated, it uses the opaque secret. This JWE uses the JSON compact serialization format shown in this image below. And I did want to highlight before we start looking at actual network traffic that the JWE itself is also GOB encoded, which is unique to the Go language. So we can see here down at the bottom that the JSON compact serialization format consists of five parts, the header, the encrypted key, the initialization vector, the ciphertext, and the authentication tag. The important part is the red ciphertext block. That is where all of our actual C2 data will go. Let's take a quick look at the header. The header itself gets broken down into several different pieces. We can see here that this JWE is using the algorithm, which again is the PBK DF2 through HMAC SHA-512 with AES-256 key wrapping. This uses 500,000 iterations of PBK DF2, which you can see in the P2C parameter. The data itself is also AES-256 GCM encrypted. And this last field, the PS2, is a random 128-bit. This is an example of what actual Merlin traffic looks like going back and forth. 
This is the server responding to a status check-in with an agent kill message. I've highlighted the dot separators between the different parts of the JWE. The last section, the authentication tag was trimmed off the output because the image was too long, but the bulk of this message is the red block or the ciphertext. So that covers how the Merlin HTTP payload traffic is encrypted going back and forth. Previous versions of Merlin did not have any type of message authentication or authorization. This allowed anyone to send a crafted message, a JSON structure, to the server, and it would attempt to process it. The integration of the opaque protocol provided authentication, but it did not provide message authorization. To combat this, JSON web tokens were implemented in the HTTP authorization header. The Merlin server will now return a 404 for all messages that do not contain a JWT. Merlin uses encrypted and signed JSON web tokens in the compact serialization format for authentication and authorization. This structure will look just like the JWEs we talked about for the HTTP payload a minute ago. So there are two different processes that Merlin leverages when generating and using JWTs. When an agent first starts, it generates its own JWT before it has registered or authenticated to the server. This JWT will only allow the agent to send opaque registration and authentication messages and nothing else. The JWTs are encrypted with AES-256 using the direct algorithm. This means that there is not a per message content encryption key. When the agent generates a JWT, it is only valid for 10 seconds. And if the Merlin PSK is still the same, which is just lowercase Merlin, you can see down here this string that starts with GCU is what the key will be for the JWTs going back and forth. After the agent has completed opaque authentication, the server will create a JWT and return it to the agent in a message. From this point forward, the agent only uses the JWTs issued by the server. The JWTs created by the Merlin server have a very limited lifetime. The JWT's lifetime is calculated by adding the agent's sleep time to the maximum possible SKU value. This value is then multiplied by the agent's max retry value. For an agent using default configuration, this turns out to be three minutes and 51 seconds. I do wanna highlight that the key used to encrypt the JWTs that are sent from the server to the agent are unique per interface. So if you start two or three different interfaces, they will all have their own JWT key, and that key is randomly generated when the interface starts. They are not hard-coded. When I first rolled out JWTs, I did have problems when people were using virtual machines because the virtual machines did not use NTP, and the 10-second lifetime was a little bit too quick and would get out of sync, and it would cause an agent and server to fail checking in. Here's another quick example of the JWT. But like I mentioned, it's because it's encrypted, it is still using the JWE format. This is the same format we talked about earlier. If you'll notice this part over here between the purple and yellow text is just a dot and a dot with nothing in there. That is because we are using the direct encryption algorithm, meaning there is no content encryption key. It is just encrypted with the pre-shared key and an initialization vector. It's still a JWE overall. And this is what it looks like when a JWT is going back and forth in Merlin traffic. This is an agent sending a message to the server for check-in. I just want to quickly highlight some of the more notable features that the Merlin server has, such as tab completion, which always helps if you're not sure what to run, as well as help menus that I've put a lot of time in making sure are documented well. Additionally, it has module support and does well with creating server logs and UTC timestamps. Probably my favorite feature is the host system command execution. And this is where any command that you type that is not a valid Merlin command will end up executing that program on the host operating system. This can be useful for doing things like finding out your network interface address while you're using the Merlin server without having to switch to another screen. And lastly, the Merlin server will always generate a self-signed TLS certificate if you don't provide it one that's signed by a trusted authority. Merlin has four menu systems, the main menu, the listener menu, which is where you configure listeners to receive agent traffic, the agent menu, which is where you interact with agents, 
and a modules menu. Modules are just composed of a JSON file that can be loaded at runtime or beforehand. And there are two different types of modules, both standard and extended. Standard modules simply use a series of commands like a script, while extended modules leverage native Go code that is compiled already. I wanted the Merlin agent to be easy for people to use. Because of that, I made it to where you can pass an agent configuration both at execution time or at compile time. The Merlin agent has a couple native commands that keep you from having to run binaries on the host operating system, such as ls and print working directory, and also comes with verbose and debug output should you need it. The Merlin agent does have a Windows DLL component that can be useful for doing things like application whitelist bypassing using live off the land binaries. And another favorite feature of mine is the dynamic JA3 hash modification that allows you to change the client's fingerprint at any given time, which we will go through later. You can download a pre-compiled version of Merlin from the GitHub page. I do recommend that as it's easy to use, but sometimes you might find yourself in a situation where you like to compile the agent yourself. This is useful when you want all of your values hard-coded in, so that way you don't have to pass command line parameters when executing it. There are some prerequisites for getting started to building your own agent, such as having Go installed, Git, and then MinGW if you'd like to compile the DLL. Merlin comes with a make file that you can pass command line arguments, such as the URL, pre-shared key, proxy, host, protocol, and J3Hash that will compile you an agent with those settings already configured in the agent for execution. In this video, I will show you how to build a Merlin agent from source with a hard-coded configuration so that way you can execute the agent without passing any command line parameters. To get started, we need to make sure that a few applications are installed. We need to make sure that make, git, and ngw are installed. With the last one only being used to compile the Windows DLL. We also need to make sure that Go is installed. I've already installed Go on this host. Let's go ahead and grab a copy of the Merlin source code from GitHub using the go get command. All right, let's go to this directory. The Merlin source code contains a make file, which has build targets for the agent and the server. To use the make file, you issue make, followed by the build target, which in this case will be agent dash and then the operating system you'd like to build for. If you're not sure, you can give a double tab and it will list out the different targets. We're going to make a Linux agent. When using make, you can also pass command line arguments to make to hard code in certain values. We'll go ahead and set up the URL value. We'll hard code the pre shared key. And we'll hard code the protocol. We're going to use the clear text version of HTTP2. This is going to build the agent and output it to the data temp directory, followed by a folder that matches the current Merlin version number, as well as another folder that is a hash of the git commit for the source code we're working with. Let's go ahead and execute this agent. I'm going to use the verbose flag just so we can see what's going on, but otherwise I'm not passing any other configure information. I've already pre-set up a Merlin server to receive this traffic. All right, we can see the agent successfully checked in to our hard-coded information using this URL right here. One of the downsides to using this way to hard configure settings is that 
When you look at the Merlin Executable Help menu, our hard-coded information shows up here. So you can see our pre-shared key it shows up in the Help menu, as well as our target URL. This can be a problem if a defender manages to get a hold of your executable because they can use this to easily grab out this information. One thing that we can do to get around this is to modify the source code. We'll do that by editing the package agent and then agent.go file. This is the source code for the agent itself. If you come down here to line 112 in the new function, this is where you'll find some of the settings we can hard configure. Let's start by setting the protocol. Set it to H2C. We'll also take advantage of modifying this user agent here since this one is for Windows. We'll set it to match a Linux host. We can also come down here and hard code in a kill date, which is an epoch timestamp. I've already created one for a date in the future, November 24th. We can also hard code in our URL. And if we scroll down just a couple more lines, we could hard code in the pre-shared key as well. All right, let's save this file. This time we'll call make, but we won't pass any arguments to make itself. We'll rebuild the Linux binary. And let's check out the help menu again to see what that looks like. All right, we can see the default information is back again. We cannot see the information we hard coded in the help menu. I will say that this doesn't mean that it can never be recovered, it just makes it a little bit harder. Let's go ahead and execute the agent without any command on arguments except for I'll use the verbose flag just so we can see that it's checking in. So we can see here that is again talking to our hard-coded URL that we put in earlier. So using these tips, you can pre-build a custom Merlin agent so that way you can execute it on target without having to pass any command line parameters. This comes useful to try and maybe evade detection from process create or when you're embedding Merlin in another tool to execute the binary itself. Content delivery networks support the HTTP2 protocol from the client to the CDN itself. So from my computer to something like Amazon CloudFront, it works, but the CDN does not use the HTTP2 protocol going from the content delivery network back to the origin server where traffic is actually received at. Because of this, you can only accomplish domain fronting using the HTTP 1.1 protocol. I added support for this version back in Merlin version 0.8, just so we could take advantage of the domain fronting technique for command and control. This is done by adding in the host header feature, which allows you to specify your own origin server. Domain fronting can take place over HTTPS for a few number of CDNs. However, Amazon's CloudFront mitigated domain fronting for HTTPS connections but you can still leverage the technique if you're using plain text HTTP. Depending on your situation, this risk could be acceptable because Merlin uses HTTP payload encryption through the encrypted JWE messages we talked about earlier. In this video, I'm going to show you how to configure Merlin to leverage the domain fronting technique through Amazon's CloudFront CDN. To get started, we need to find a target domain to send traffic through. To find a good target, you can look for DNS records with a CNAME entry that ends in CloudFront.net, which is Amazon CDN. 
I have a good one to target. Let's look up its DNS record. All right, we can see here that status.semantic.com uses the CloudFront CDN with the endpoint that starts with D14. I have already pre-set up my own CloudFront distribution and EC2 instance for this demo. You will need to do this yourself if you want to leverage the domain fronting technique. In this tab over here, I've configured the Merlin server on the EC2 instance to listen on all interfaces and the CloudFront distribution I've already set up points to this EC2 instance. Let's go ahead and execute an agent really quick. On this host, I've configured the Merlin agent to connect to http colon slash slash status.semantic.com forward slash updates. Using the pre-share key I configured the Merlin interface with. Using the plain text HTTP protocol, which is required to do domain fronting through Amazon. And I've set the host header of the traffic to match my CloudFront distribution. This is a different endpoint from the one we recovered when we looked up the DNS record for Symantec. I've also set the sleep to five seconds to make it go quicker, and I've turned on verbose output. All right, you can see here that traffic is going to status.semantic.com forward slash updates like we expect. All right, looks like the agent has successfully checked in. Let's go to the Merlin server. All right, we can see here that our Merlin agent checked in and it is using the status.semantic.com domain to send traffic through. Let's go ahead and interact with the agent really quick. We can see the agent's configuration. Let's issue a quick command to it to list the print working directory. Let's also use a module on this agent really quick. We'll go ahead and use the Swift Belt module. This module leverages a tool written by Cedric Owens that does some Mac OS enumeration. The only thing that we need to set is the agent. All right, we can see here that the Swift Belt output was returned to us. These are some of the commands that were ran on the host last. And this was just a demo of setting up Merlin to do domain fronting using Amazon CDN by sending traffic through status.semantic.com. Windows Defender will flag pre-compiled versions of Merlin as a threat, but there is a simple trick you can use to circumvent this detection. In this video, I'm gonna show you a simple trick to get the Merlin agent past Windows Defender. Let's get started by going to the Merlin GitHub page and downloading a pre-compiled version of the agent. All of the files here are password protected with a lowercase string Merlin. This is just to prevent inline proxies from inspecting the file contents. We can see that Windows Defender has detected a threat. The Merlin agent is marked here as this virus tool Win32 Merlin. Let's go ahead and turn off real time protection for just a second so we can do some troubleshooting. We're going to use a program called Defender Check by Matt Hand. What this program does is it basically takes a file and it splits it up into chunks and submits it to Defender to figure out where the bad bytes are. I already have a compiled version of Defender check on my desktop. To run Defender check, you just have to pass it one 
argument, and that is the file path of the file you want to evaluate. I'm not actually going to run it here because last time I did it took about three minutes on this virtual machine. But I've gone ahead and ran Defender Check in this tab over here. You can see that Defender Check identified the bad bytes at offset CD6067 with the same signature we saw a second ago. Looking at the end of the bytes over here, I'm willing to bet that it's flagging on either my handle or the string Merlin. Let's go ahead and modify the file with HXD. HXD has a neat feature where you can just jump straight to the offset that Defender Check told us about. It's kind of hard to see, but if you look down here, you can see that that offset takes us to this period at the end of the string of Neon Dog Merlin Package Core Core.go. What we're going to do is a simple find and replace. We're going to find all instances of the string Merlin and replace it with Magix. The replacement string length does need to match the source string length. All right, we've replaced 52 occurrences of the string Merlin. Let's go ahead and save our executable. HXD likes to save a backup copy of the binary. We're going to delete that so that way it doesn't get detected when we turn Defender back on. All right, let's resubmit our file with Defender Check. And perfect. No threats found this time. Let's go ahead and turn real-time protection back on. We also need to make the same modification to the Merlin server itself. The reason is because when we changed the string Merlin to Magix, it modified the gob encoding message structure, and we need to tell the server about it as well. To do this, we're just going to use sed to find and replace that value in the server executable. global replace like on the Merlin server executable and we'll save that as Merlin server modified. We'll make that file executable and we'll go ahead and start the server. I'm going to copy in a set of commands that will start us up a listener so we can check in an agent. Go back to our Windows host and fire off an agent. This is the command I'm going to use to check in an agent to the server that we just started a second ago. I do want to note that the Windows agent will not output any information to standard out, but it does start its own process. We can verify that it's running in the task manager. So you can see right here that the Merlin agent is running. Go back to the server and verify that it's there. All right, our agent has checked in. Let's issue a simple command like print working directory. And then we'll issue the kill command after that. We can see that the print working directory command finished just fine and the agent was also killed and removed from the server. Looking back over here, Real-time protection is still on and no threat was found. So there you go. Simple find and replace on the string Merlin with Magix and you can get past Defender. When network traffic uses TLS, it's not easy to inspect the message contents to determine if it's from a command and control client running their network. However, the client and server's TLS configuration are sent in the clear and can be unique and specific to a client. JA3 is a tool for fingerprinting clients and servers based on these accessible TLS settings, which I'll show you on the next slide. The tool calculates an MD5 hash based on the client's TLS settings from these five key fields, the SSL TLS version number, the supported cipher suites, the supported TLS extensions, 
the elliptic curves and the elliptic curve point format. I do want to highlight that there is a JA3 fingerprint database that contains a list of all known JA3 hashes and another data set that matches them to known user agent strings. Now keep in mind, Merlin is just a TLS client as well that uses its own unique configuration. A network defender could detect Merlin traffic based solely on its JA3 hash without having to view the actual message traffic itself. This slide shows over here in green and purple what the Merlin default JA3 hash is. One of my coworkers, Max Harley, has developed a library that allows a client to dynamically change its configuration by providing it the unhashed configuration settings used with JA3. This has been integrated in, into Merlin and can be used to change the client while it's already running or by passing it a command line parameter when it starts. Here's an example of some of the fields that JA3 uses to calculate the hash. Not all of the fields are displayed in this image. In this video, I'm going to show you how to detect Merlin traffic based off its JA3 fingerprint. JA3 is a method for creating SSL TLS client fingerprints based on information such as the SSL TLS version number, cipher suites, extensions, and a couple other fields as well. Following this, I'll show you how we can dynamically change our JA3 fingerprint on the fly to evade detections. To get started, we'll execute a packet capture. Switch over to this tab and check in an agent. We'll wait for it to finish opaque registration and authentication. All right, we can kill this. And we can stop our packet capture. Now let's use the JA3 tool to calculate the default Merlin client hash. What I'm going to do is use the Python script and I'm going to pass in the PCAP that we just made. And you can see here, this is the Merlin client default TLS fingerprint. We're gonna use a site called ja 3 and here this site will tell you what your current JA3 fingerprint is. It also provides you the ability to check a hash. Let's check the Merlin client. All right, Merlin client was not found in the database. This website also provides you the opportunity to download a copy of its database or JA3 hashes with their associated user agent strings. I've gone ahead and loaded up a copy of one of the JSON files over here. We're going to use this JA3 string to configure the Merlin agent with. Come back over here. We'll start a new packet capture. And we will check an agent in. Let's go to the server and wait for the agent to check in. This one you see here is from the test we did a minute ago. By issuing the set JA3 command, you can paste in a JA3 string and the agent will use it to configure itself with that. Let's visit over here to make sure the agent receives the command. And you can see right here that I did. Now I've pre-selected another JA3 string out of the database. We'll configure the Merlin client again. Again, we'll go to the agent and wait for it to receive the command. Which it has. Let's go ahead and kill the agent. And we can also stop our packet capture.
Let's go ahead and use the JA3 tool to calculate the hashes again. So you can see here, this is the default Merlin client TLS JA3 fingerprint. And here is the fingerprint after we changed it the first time. And you can see we changed it again to a different hash. So out of all the captured traffic, it was one Merlin client, but it had three different hashes. Another useful thing you can do is you can take this hash you can visit this database and you can look up the user agent string that it was associated with. So we can see here that this hash was used with this user agent string in 2019. I will say that you have to be careful when you configure the Merlin agent to use a specific J3 string because you could ask the agent to configure itself and use Cypher suites or TLS extensions that it does not support. And if you do this, it will end up breaking the agent from communicating with the server. So be careful when you do that. This is also useful for evading detection when a defender is looking for traffic based off of a JA3 hash. And one last thing, we didn't go through it in here, but you can also specify a JA3 string at execution time if you would like using this command line argument. In today's presentation, we talked about Merlin, a cross-platform post-exploitation command and control server and agent written in Go. This tool leverages both the HTTP 1, 2, and 3 protocols. Additionally, Merlin uses the opaque authenticated key exchange message to establish a symmetric secret between the server and the client. Merlin also leverages JWTs for authentication and authorization to facilitate which messages it's allowed to talk with the server about. Merlin leverages payload encryption through JWEs, so that way a defender looking at traffic will not actually be able to decrypt the message contents itself. The Merlin server has the ability to instantiate multiple listeners using multiple protocols all at the same time. We also did a quick walkthrough on customizing agents by hard coding and values at compile time as well as evasion tips, such as ways to bypass Windows Defender threat detection and changing the JA3 hash of the Merlin client on the fly. Thank you for attending my presentation and I'll stick around for any questions.